All right, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, today I'm hosting another one of our Lab Chart Mastery series. Uh, today we're going to talk about common channel calculations, uh, cyclic measurements, integral, and derivative. My name is David Rehm. I am the technical support engineer for uh, AD Instruments North America. And I, previously I was the only technical support engineer, but now we have actually added Emily Peace in our Boston office. So for those of you out there on the East Coast, uh, definitely uh, contact Emily uh, if you have any questions about uh, technical support with our software or hardware. And as I said, we're, today we're going to cover uh, cyclic measurements, integral and derivative. But before we get going, I just want to kind of talk about some webinar guidelines and a few things I want to get out of the way before we kind of get in the meat of today's webinar. So the first thing I want to cover here is, like I said, is the webinar guidelines. Uh, you'll probably already notice all audio from attendees is muted during the presentation. That's just to keep any background noise down and uh, also to keep us on track so that we can cover all the material we'd like to cover today. Uh, if you want to talk to me or ask questions, please use the GoToWebinar toolbar. You'll see here on the left-hand side if you're on a Macintosh, uh, that's, what, that's the kind of structure you'll see. If you're uh, using a Windows machine, you'll see it here, whatever is here over on the right. Very, very similar, but uh, if you have questions in the presentation, uh, please answer them here via the questions window or via the chat window, and they will be answered in the turn they were received at the end of the presentation. Also, I'd like to kind of talk about some upcoming training events we have, uh, both in Boston on the 23rd and 24th of October, as well as the 21st and 22nd of November. We will be hosting lab chart training courses, levels 1, 2, and 3. That's a two-day course. Uh, we do charge for these. And then following up in December, we're going to be hosting a course here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. You'll get to see me, and I'll get to teach uh, a portion of that course uh, on the 11th and 12th of December. Also, we're bringing in a new component of our training courses. We're going to do advanced lab chart training levels, and that will be uh, level four. And that will be on the 13th. So if you wanted to come out for the uh, course for the 11th and the 12th, the course on the 13th will just you kind of flow right into it. And it will be going even deeper than we normally do in our training courses, custom macros. We can look at your specific data. Uh, just really, really pointed analysis that's specific for you. So if you're looking to do some really heavy analysis with lab chart, uh, definitely that would be something of interest to you. A little note, though, you will have to attend levels 1, 2, and 3. Uh, before coming to a level four course because we just want to make sure we're all on the same page as far as what lab chart can do. So if that sounds interesting to you, uh, go ahead and contact myself or your sales rep and they'll be able to give you more information about that. Also, we have an uh, upcoming webinar uh, on the 15th of October. It's going to be data visualiz visualization and presentation, visually navigating lab chart and exporting images. So just kind of the basics of moving around in a lab chart. Uh, how to bring out the views you see in lab chart as images and actually put them in presentations or uh, put them in your research papers that you are writing as well. Uh, if you're ever curious about what's coming up for us, what trade shows we'll be at, uh, what workshops we have coming up, what's the next uh, run of webinars, uh, please go to adinstruments.com and click on the events page and select North America and it'll let you know everything that is happening here in North America. Also, uh, we are present on many different social networks, YouTube, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. So if you want to know about the latest and greatest from AD Instruments, definitely follow us on your uh, social network of choice. Also, a little bit of boilerplate here to go through, I guess, uh, just to kind of cover some questions I get on a regular basis from customers who are calling for support. So you don't have to read all of this. Uh, but but they, basically the take-home message from this little uh, statement of intended use here is that our products and software are not intended for clinical monitoring. They cannot be used to diagnose, treat, or monitor a subject. Uh, you can definitely do clinical research with them, but we definitely don't want to be monitoring uh, or diagnosing a subject with them. Also, what can I or can I not connect to a human being? Uh, if you see this body protected symbol here on the, the top left here, the little man in the box, definitely means you're approved to connect to a human being. No problems. Uh, if you see the cardiac protected symbol here, the heart in the box, means we can have a direct electrical connection to the heart with this device, and it is certified for that. So uh, before we start using human subjects, definitely look for these symbols to make sure. 
Also, I get a lot of people uh, calling for IRB processes and different things of how do I know what's being input in the, into the Power Lab is accurately being reproduced in LabChart. Uh, we spent much time and expense at getting uh, certified with the quality management system ISO 9, 9001. Basically, they go through, look at our manufacturing, manufacturing products, excuse me, our uh, verification processes, design process, et cetera, et cetera, and, and make sure that we are doing it in compliance with current known uh, industrial standards. So if you need this, this certificate saying we're certified, by all means ask us. It's available on our website, and I can also get it for you. Uh, just to give somebody saying, okay, well, how do we know this is a quality piece of equipment? This is how we're certifying that what you're seeing in the in lab chart is what is actually being applied to the front of the power lab. And thankfully, that is the last of our little boilerplate there. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, if you if you've opened the the uh, channel calculations menu, you know there's many more options than this right here. But these are the most common uh, that people use. So cyclic measurements, a really powerful built-in feature in the basic version of Lab Chart uh, that we can use to analyze rhythmic signals and uh, and pull a variety of parameters out from them. Uh, waveform. We'll talk about waveform detection in there, and also how it's marking events, what the event markers look like, etc. Uh, then we'll move on to derivative. Uh, delta delta x over over delta y, how things are changing over time. Uh, the derivative types, we'll talk about the window width that the derivative function uses. And then last but not least, we'll talk about integral. Uh, area under the curve is what some of you may know it as. How it works, uh, what are the different reset types in lab chart, what are the different integral types that you can perform. So except for a very one more slide that is where we are going to be moving on from my presentation and going directly into lab chart. So as I said, the first thing I'm going to cover is cyclic measurements. Cyclic measurements is great for analyzing many biological signals because many are rhythmic. Uh, for instance, we're looking at a blood pressure file here. I have left ventricular pressure being recorded up here in channel 1, and I have arterial pressure being recorded down here in channel 2. Now I'm going to go ahead and add a channel. Hit OK here so we can do some cyclic measurements calculations. In this new channel, and you can get to the channel calculations one of two ways, or you can, uh, two, this is one of two ways I should say. I'll show the next one right after it here. If I left click on a channel title, I can access the cyclic measurements or excuse me, the uh, channel calculations menu. Another way I can get to it is if I go back to setup, channel settings, you'll see here on the right hand side of this window, we have this calculation option. If I left click on that, we get our channel calculations menu pops up again. Which way is best? Depends on you, whatever works best for you. Uh, you can set a bunch of them up uh, in rapid succession here if you want to before recording. Or if you need to change things on the fly, sometimes it's easier to do it out here in the uh, drop-down menu from the channel title. So I'm going to go ahead and select cyclic measurements here. And up will come the cyclic measurements settings dialog for channel 3. Now the first thing we'll notice here, and you'll see this repeat throughout lab chart, uh, a lot of our settings windows will look very similar to this. Uh, a lot of our modules use cyclic measurements as the basis for their detection, but they'll of course do a variety of tweaks to it to make it perform better for the specific signal that they're designed for. But uh, just to kind of get started here, first thing that Cyclic needs to know is, okay, what is the source channel I need to look at and perform this calculation from? So I can go ahead and choose my ventricular pressure here, my arterial. Uh, you know what, I'm just going to leave it at ventricular pressure. Next, Cyclic says, well, what do I need, what type of measurement do I need to make? There are a variety of measurements available to us. Rate, of course, beats per minute, breaths per minute, et cetera. Period, how long between each event. Frequency, the rate of the occurrence in Hertz. How many times do we have this cyclic event? Can't would be count. The mean value of these cyclic events. The minimum value for each cyclic event. The maximum value of each cyclic event. The height, uh, for those of you who are used to uh, messing with hemodynamic parameters, 
mean arterial pressure, one-third max plus two-thirds min. We can also do the integral of each event, variance, the minimum derivative, the maximum derivative, and we can also just drop a unit spike at each event if we want to. So all of these are available to you. Uh, whatever works best for you, definitely select it from here. I'm going to leave it at rate, so we'll calculate heart rate off the ventricular channel here. The output, well, how do you want me to put things out in, is, is what cyclic measurement is asking us here. Auto scale, the scale should automatically scale to however, uh, whatever, wherever our beats per minute are at, fine. Do I want to set a specific scale for them? I don't care if it's outside of this, you can do that here. Event markers. I'll talk about this in a second. It's easier to explain it whenever I get to a, a point further into the uh, uh, presentation here. Also, how many decimal places do I want this calculation to be calculated out to? Now down here you'll see preview of detected cycles. Notice these little white dots here over the top. That's lab chart saying, okay, I am saying this is a cyclic event. For you telling me to look at this signal I am identifying this as an event. These white dots, we can actually choose to have them shown out here in the chart view if we want to. By default, they are not. However, if I click this event markers checkbox, they will show up out here. I'm going to leave it clicked so after we do this calculation, we can kind of show things, how they look out here. But you'll see here in this preview option, on the left-hand side here, very similar to our y-axis out here in lab chart, all the same controls are there. We can zoom, we can auto scale, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we also have our nice uh, scroll down here. We can change compression just like we can out, out in lab chart. Now you'll notice on the right hand side we have another y-axis and it's in standard deviation. This is, and I'm going to go ahead here, you can change the overlays. By default they're, they're actually laid over the top of each other. But if I click this, it kind of moves it up and I get this red trace, which is the actual data trace, and then I have this black trace down here. What does this black trace mean? What is it telling us? Cyclic measurements, the way it detects things, it will usually pre-process the signal in some way. It'll smooth it. It'll normalize it. It will look for the derivative. It'll do a bunch of different things to make it easier for the software to actually detect a cycle on how we're telling it to detect it. Once it does that, it uses this black trace to detect the cycles. Then once it's detected the cycles, it goes back to the raw data and calculates uh, whatever we're asking cyclic measurements to calculate. Nothing is calculated from this. This is just a detection template for us. Uh, the reason it's in standard deviation right now is how we have cyclic measurements set up by default, and we'll talk about that more. Uh, like I said, you can also use this button to overlay the two. We can change the scaling for the two if we want to here depending on however we want, or we can even remove that black trace period by clicking this button. Moving down the page, you'll see these detection settings that are pre-built into lab chart. We have a lot of, since you know, we most of our customers are doing some pretty consistent measurements on very specific signals. Uh, we have a, a variety of uh, presets in here, so there's some general ones uh, square shape, spiky shape, sign shape. Basically, cyclic is set up with some pre-processing steps that enable it to identify events with those in those specific signals better. Uh, simple threshold, we'll talk about that more. These are a little simpler detection, but these right here start normalizing and doing a variety of things, actually everything through here. Uh, of course, we have ECG detection uh, presets, dog, large, small, guinea pig, human, mouse, pig, rat, rabbit rat, etc. Things for respiration signals that are pretty typical coming into lab chart in the power lab, cardiovascular, and of course the finger pulse transducers we, we market. For us here, obviously, we're looking at a ventricular pressure signal. Cardiovascular ventricular pressure would be best. You can see that the sine wave was doing a good job, but there are some parameters that maybe whenever we get some variation of ventricular pressure that selecting that preset will do a better job with. Detection adjustment, minimum peak height. If lab chart is using a normalization preprocess, and I'll talk about that more, what that means in, the, in, the, in a bit here, this will be in standard deviation. 
if it is using a simple threshold, it will be in whatever units are being shown out here. Uh, cardiovascular detection setting here, we're going to be using standard deviation. Now, what does that mean, if the minimum peak height? You'll notice as I start moving it up, we start losing, lab chart can't detect all of these beats because there's variation. Start dropping it down, and we're good. You can also, you can type it in here, you can use these arrows, or you can use a slider to set it here. I'd also like to point out the little help menu topic button right here. You'll see these show up throughout lab chart. If you left click them, they will take you to the exact help menu topic for the window you were in. So if I forget what standard deviation means or detection settings and stuff like that, it will take me right to the topic that tells me how to use this window, how to set it up. Also, there is a customize and save option here. I'm going to talk about these in a little bit. But I think first what we need to do here is just go ahead and do a cyclic measurement in a new channel. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And you can see here, I'm going to drag out a DVM. In channel 3, we are now seeing the heart rate for this animal. I believe this is a rat, if memory serves me correctly. And it is updating, you'll notice. Beat to beat. And you'll see here, since we selected event markers, lab chart is saying, OK, here's a cycle, here's a cycle, here's a cycle. Right here, we're saying, OK, for this given period between these two, this is the beats per minute. For the next two, OK, the period has got a little bit longer. But here, so here is the beats per minute for it. And it's going to update it for every cycle. Some of our other more powerful modules allow you to average over specific cycles, uh, but cyclic measurements doesn't provide that. Now, with cyclic measurements, do I have to create a new channel to do this? No, I do not. I could actually do it over the top of the raw data if I wanted to. Hit OK, auto scale, and cyclic is looking at the raw data underneath and then giving us the heart rate right here. Does that mean that we have lost that raw data? No, we can just go back here, left click, hit no calculation. I'm going to do an auto scale, and there's our raw data again. Lab chart always keeps track of the raw data. And the important thing to remember about channel calculations like this, they are not affecting the raw data. They're leaving it alone. They're just looking at it, doing some detection pre-processing for their own template, and then selecting from the raw data and, and performing your calculation. But you're, by no means are you limited to you need to go out here to another channel and actually do it. You could do it over the top of the arterial here if you want to, or you can do it over the actual channel you're calculating from. Uh, kind of a great way if you start running out of channels, you're doing a lot of calculations, we can kind of just go over raw data if we don't need to see the raw data. We're just more concerned about the actual calculation. And of course, we can kind of keep going here. I'm going to right click out here and add another channel. We're not limited to just a one channel. I can go to cyclic measurements again. Say, OK, rate's great. I'd like to see that. Uh, but I want to see, say, the maximum for each cycle. Hit OK. Here's our maximum value for each cycle. And I can just keep adding and adding here. There's no limit. Also, say, for instance, well, I don't care about the max for my ventricular pressure. I want to know about the max for my arterial pressure. Great, we go down here, we select arterial pressure from our presets, and I find the max for that. I hit OK, and now we have the max we're actually pulling from here. Now notice I did not check the event marker option here, so I am not seeing them. If I do check it, I hit OK, we start getting event markers. Now the event markers for cyclic measurement Measurements are different from our other modules. They will be these white circles. Most of our modules will have a green circle here to say they're, they've identified an event. So as you can see, we can 
pull a bunch of things out of a signal and actually put it put it here uh, into lab chart and have them calculate in real time. Uh, these will update in real time. We're not limited to doing this offline. So for instance, I'm going to go ahead and close this file. I'm going to reopen it as a playback file. We'll go down to three channels again. And I can go in here and I can set up cyclic measurements again. We'll do rate, ventricular pressure, great. Set it up here, hit OK. I start recording. And cyclic starts identifying. There will be some delay because, of course, cyclic needs to have enough data points to be able to go in here and actually do the calculation. Depending on the pre-processing we're doing as well, that can take some delay. Oh, it can cause some delay. But as you can see here, populating in real time. Those of you who may be Mac users out there, unfortunately, we are working on making it live. You do not have the ability to see a live cyclic measurements calculation while you're recording data in the Mac side. Uh, it's not like I said, it's something we're working on. Hopefully with the next release of the Mac software, we'll have uh, that up and running. And you are not strictly limited to working in the chart view with cyclic measurements either. So if I open the data pad here, and I'm going to do a smart tile, and I'm going to go ahead and turn off all the defaults that come up here. Okay, if I left click here on column one, column A, you'll see there is a cyclic measurements topic. If I click on that, every, almost everything that's available to me in the cyclic measurements channel calculation are also available so we can pull a hard number out of the data. So say I want to know the average cyclic period for the ventricular pressure channel here for a selection. If I hit OK, I go and make a selection here. Lab chart's going to tell me what the average period is for that. I can hit add to data pad and I can save that. So another way to bring data out. Like I said, this is where you're going to get those hard numbers because a lot of people, well, your squiggly line here really doesn't mean anything to me. I want to know what the averages are. I want to know how the, the trends over time. I want to know the hard numbers and this is the way we would do it with, with the data pad. So those are the basics of cyclic measurements. Now I'm going to talk about more. If I go ahead here, and like I said, once again, to get to it, left click on the channel title or go to channel settings that are set up. Select cyclic measurements. And we open it here. Now we've all kind of covered everything here that we're seeing. But I mentioned that there is this customize option. Now we realize that your data is not going to be this pretty. Maybe it's got some variation in it that is, that's making it tough for the preset to detect. So we give you the ability and the tools to go in and change the pre-processing to better detect events for you. So to do this, we go to Customize, and it brings open another settings window. This kind of allows us to lift the hood on cyclic measurements and say, okay, what are you doing to the signal to, to help us uh, actually detect it better? We have our preview once again and all of our y-axis and x-axis channel controls uh, where we can see actually our detection template here. The mode detection mode, what's happening? Right here you'll see pre-processing order. What is LabChart doing to the raw data to make it easier for it to detect the signals? Uh, this preset by default is just normalizing. Uh, we'll talk about normalizing in a couple of seconds, but say for instance, I want to trigger, I want to actually have uh, my peak height and kind of this whole template isn't working the best. We know what works really good for me is if I do a derivative. I can actually say, okay, look for the peak and the derivative and let's call that the event. So here you can see, I'm going to go ahead and change the overlay. Lab chart pre-processes the signal by adding a derivative, and it's putting it in the pre-processing order. Then it's normalizing, and it's saying, okay, peak of the max derivative, that's where our event occurs. 
Say you have a really, really noisy signal. Horribly noisy, a bunch of really low, small, you know, kind of random noise that's making it tough for Siglic to find a, a, a specific point to actually say, this is the event. We can actually smooth in here. Uh, this signal in particular isn't great for smoothing, but you can change the smoothing window, how much you want to smooth. That's a little bit too much, obviously. But a light is smooth it better, so we get rid of any small, small noise, just small amplitude, random noise. And we can keep, you can keep compiling these together if you want to and keep adding to the pre-processing order. LabChart is going to tell you what you're doing to detect the event. Like I said, this does not affect the actual calculation. This is just pre-processing that enables LabChart to detect your events better, and then it goes back to the raw data. If you're looking at an ECG signal, you can actually say, okay, I want to look for a specific QRS width. If you have data that has really sharp spikes that are maybe a couple samples wide, uh, the median filter can do an excellent job to get rid of them, depending on the window width. I don't really have a good example file for that right here, but like I said, really sharp transient spikes, a couple of, of uh, samples long, but of course that's going to throw off cyclic if it's looking for the maximum of the value. It's going to have this crazy spike that will put the maximum really high. We can get rid of that. High pass filter. We have a wandering baseline. We can use that to pre-process. Notice we just keep stacking it in here. By default, a lot of our options use the normalization window. What does the normalization window do? It selects a region of data, finds the mean of that, and then looks at the peaks and how their standard deviation from that for that specific region. Normalization is great if we have variations in peak height throughout the file. They're, they're all good events, but maybe at one point it's 10 millimeters of mercury, the other point it's 100. But we're still detecting things, we can still use them to calculate. Normalization allows us to make to find the average mean value for a specific window. So for instance, we're looking at about five and a half seconds here, or four, or four and a half, excuse me. Looks at that, finds the mean, finds the standard deviation, and then uses the standard deviation to detect those, those heights. So it allows you to have variation and amplitude and be able to detect it really well. Uh, very powerful to use. Uh, how wide of a window should you use if the, the default's not working? Um, if you're using a window that only covers about two cycles, chances are it's too small, and it's not going to do a very good job of normalization. Uh, if you're using a window that's about 20 cycles long, uh, chances are cyclic measurements is not going to react to changes in amplitude very quickly, and you'll miss events. Uh, I can't remember if I, I don't think this is specifically from the help menu, but uh, the, my general rule is about seven six to seven cycles, have your window width about that. Actually, let's look here what we have. So what I say, four and a half seconds, one, actually quite a bit here. It's like about 12 to 18. And that if we decrease that window width, the less delay we'll have in the online calculation as well. Uh, I usually try to shoot for about 7 to 12, I think, is usually my rule of thumb. There's also a noise threshold here to say, okay, everything below this threshold, if you end up finding that with standard deviation, that is wrong. Don't use it. If we do not use standard deviation, we go straight to minimum peak height in millimeters of mercury. The different detectors, two set height, LabChart is saying, okay, you have to go up and then back down and cross a threshold here before I call you an actual peak. So it allows us to uh, account for if there's a double peak at the top, say we go up, dip down again, and then go up again, it allows us to detect that. And actually, probably a good one to look at for that would be the actual arterial pressure. 
So say, for instance, if we did just a simple threshold or peak after threshold, see if I can get it to detect here. Notice that, okay, we go above 100 and we detect the peak right after that, but the dichrotic notch here is also a small peak that's right afterwards. Threshold will have the same problems. Two-sided height is we're saying, okay, you have to go up a certain point and then down and cross a certain point before we call you one peak. So it's a great way to get rid of any, any artifacts like this. Minimum period, we can assign a minimum period if we want to. You have to be this, this, this period has to be this long in order for you to actually be detected as another cycle. Trigger off the max and man, I have a good example of the reasons why we might want to do that later. Peak search window. From the last peak, cyclic measurements has detected, it will go 600 seconds afterwards, and then it will reset and start anew. It will not consider that 600 second or longer period to be the period between events. So a great way if we have massive, you know, cyclic, 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 it stops for a long period of time and then restarts again, that we don't have this crazy huge period that we've calculated in there. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of here. Oh, before I forget, actually, if you do come up with a custom setting, I'm just going to add some unique stuff here. Hit OK. First it will say custom source. Now say I want to keep this one in a settings file that I'm going to create. I can hit save. I can name it whatever I want. Hit save and it will show up in our menu. So I go here and then I can see user setting BP custom. And this will stay with your settings file and your data file once you save it, both here as well as actually save the changes of the file. Now, I was referring to triggering off of the max and the min, and this is kind of a great example of why we may want to, do, want to do that. Cyclic is very good at figuring things out like periods, averages, stuff like that. However, the detection algorithm it uses sometimes, and this is some reasons why we've built modules that work a little bit better, isn't the best at certain things unless you actually do your own custom settings. So one of those is actually peak height. So if I turn on cyclic here, and I'm looking for the maximum. I'm doing general sign shape. And we have and we're actually triggering off the maximum here. Maximum value found between the two. You'll notice, let me go ahead and auto scale this. Maximum peak height here, 1.3 volts. Great. Maximum peak height here for this cycle is not 1.3 volts, but it has not changed. But maximum peak height right here, about 1.36. Almost exactly the same. Why is lab chart, and yet I'll even show a cyclic is actually detecting all of those as events. Why is it ignoring the height of this particular signal right here? The reason is when it determines height, lab chart looks between the two detected events and finds the maximum value. This value right here is the maximum value between those two. If I look between the next pair of events, which value is the, high, is the maximum? This value right here. So if we're not careful with, pre, with settings, especially with height, height is one of the ones that is very sensitive to this, we can end up not getting the proper calculation that we want. So that's great, David. What do I need to do? to actually change this. 
if you're looking at the height or the max here specifically, max being, like I said, some of, one of the ones that's that is an issue, all you need to do is simply change where cyclic measurements is triggering from. If we change it to the minimum, we hit OK, you can see we're actually catching the height of this as well. The reason is, is now cyclic is looking between two events and just finding the maximum value of that specific uh, event. Looking again, so for each one of our peaks here, we are actually finding the height. Now, this obviously would not be good if you're looking for the minimum of it because we're going to have the same problem we did before with looking for the max. So you have to keep this in mind when you're using cyclic that, okay, lab chart is looking between the two events. And what do I want found between those two events? And how do I make sure that that is getting uh, identified, particularly for our, our event of interest here my, my, in my calculation? So definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, this is actually a pretty common pitfall uh, for some customers when they start using cyclic more, for more elaborate things. And they want something like height, or they want something like max or min. You just need to keep that in mind. Think about what lab chart is doing. And of course, if you aren't quite sure what lab chart is doing for a better idea, you can always click here for the specific topic. Here's the overview. How does lab chart do things? And then you can keep going through the different ones. What are its measurements that are available? Selections, setting scales, everything you need to know here is in the help menu. A lot of people have bad experiences with Windows-based help menus. I pride, I take great pride in, in ours in LabChart. It's one of the better ones I've ever used, and it's more of a paperless software manual versus uh, your typical help menu you'll see in, in Windows. So that takes us to the end of cyclic measurements. And now I am going to move on to derivative. Derivative, what does it mean? Derivative, the change in y over the change in x. The slope is what it's very commonly referred to as well. What is the rate of change here? That would be the first derivative. What is the angle or what is the what is the slope right here that we're seeing? Positive or negative? So to calculate this, we can use, there is actually a channel calculation for derivative in lab chart. Once again, I got to that by clicking, left clicking the channel title, but of course we can go to set up channel settings and get it there as well. Just like cyclic measurements, I can do this in another channel or I can do it over the top of the raw data. Doesn't matter. So if I left click derivative here, it brings up the derivative settings window. A little similar to cyclic, just not as uh, uh, extensive. First thing, just like everything, what Galapter is asking, what do you want me to look at and calculate the derivative from? We, of course, want to look at channel one here, our wave. Uh, it asks for the window width. We'll talk about that in a second. What order of derivative do we want to use? First, which would be slope, how steep these slopes are, positive or negative. Second derivative will be, okay, when are we changing direction? Negative is when we're kind of curving down like this, positive when we're curving up. And those are the derivative options you have in this particular window. So I'm going to go back to the first. Set scale, what do I want to use? How many decimal places? Do I want it to auto scale? And of course our old friend here, the help menu button. I'll take you straight to the menu button for derivative. If I hit OK with a three with a three point window, that's what I get. You can see here our peak is roughly at the steepest positive slope and roughly at the negative 
steepest part of the negative slope here. Now you'll also see there's some noise in this signal and it is doing horrible things to the derivative. The derivative is very noisy here because we have all these really tiny wobbles and changes that are in turn are being reflected here in the derivative. We can take care of this with window width. So right now we're just looking to calculate the derivative. We're drawing a line through three points and calculating the derivative because there's no way to calculate the derivative for one point. You have to know what's happening. Where is it progressing? How is it changing from point to point? So by default, we are doing three points here. Uh, we can do up to 255 if memory serves. It always has to be an odd value because we have a central point and then one on each side. Or three or four or five, whatever. The larger the window, I'm going to go up to 13 here, the more we remove this noise. I'm going to go up to 51 here, hit OK. And now we have a much better representation of the derivative. That still may not be enough for some. Very clean. Is there one specific value I need to use for the window width of the derivative? No, there is not. Uh, this is kind of a trial and error thing, what works best for you. It can have an impact on accuracy if we use too large of one. Obviously, we've seen it can have an impact on accuracy if we use too small of one. But uh, it's definitely trial and error and you determining what's acceptable for your specific application. Of course, I can do multiple derivatives on the same signal. So I'm going to add another channel and we'll take a look here at what the second derivative looks like for channel one. We'll do a relatively high and see how it lines up. Now notice, as I was saying before, the first derivative is going to line up with the steepest part of the slope. Its peak will be there. Negative peak will be the steepest part of a negative slope such as this. The positive part, part of the second derivative is going to be whenever we're kind of cupping up with the trace here. We're, we're transitioning and going up. Negative whenever we're transitioning from going up to going down. And the amount of the value, the higher the value, the sharper this is right here. Uh, actually the second derivative is very helpful in finding end diastolic pressures in uh, certain blood pressure signals. Matter of fact, I have a pressure volume signal here. Actually, this one may not be work best for us. Let me go back to our old familiar one here of the blood pressure. I'm going to add another channel. Do the second derivative. We'll do it on channel one. Hit OK. Horribly noisy. So let's go ahead and smooth this guy out a little bit by making a larger window width. See, we are curving down, curving up right there. At that point, is usually the end isolate pressure point. And there can be some variation here. Uh, we can do some, maybe scale it back a little bit, how much, how large of a window it's using here, and it'll make it much more accurate. But that's one use of the second derivative, is to actually find end diastolic pressure. So that's how you would do a derivative the slope in the lab chart with a channel calculation. Next we'll talk about integral. And as I said, what is integral? It's area under the curve. Uh, let me think of a better, see if this is a good, here we go. 
This one might be better, actually. Area under the curve. So up here we have a flow signal. It's a one-way flow signal. This is these downward dips are correspond to exhalation. So we have a one-way mask on a on a, sub, on a subject here. They're breathing, and we want to know well what's the volume here? What has changed? The integral will be the way to do that. Actually, let me go ahead here and go back to a sine wave. I think we might have a little bit better better luck with that. Let's do a straight derivative or a straight integral here. Standard integral, no reset. We hit OK, and we're calculating the area under this curve. as it comes back. So ways for us to quantify similar events, but also events that don't appear to be similar. Maybe we have an event after this that is much lower amplitude. However, it lasts for much longer. Are those, is the area of the curve the same for those? Can we, com we can compare dissimilar ones that way. Is there impact on our data? Or is the impact from whatever we're applying to the, the, the test subject actually working there? And is, is, what is it doing? Where this can be very useful, and there are different types of integral in lab chart. And one of them, if I can find it here, is actually looking at EEG and saying, using integral to determine, okay, well, what is the activity going on here. Because I can look at this and I can see bursts of alpha wave activity activity here, right? And I can actually see it and see what's going to going on here and determine, okay, well something is happening here. There's activity, but how do I quantify that? Integral is a great way to do that. Now there are like I said, there are a variety of integrals. There's a standard integral that just negative and positive portions of the signal impact it the same way. However, it, it can drift significantly if we don't end up changing it. So you can see here, this really doesn't tell us anything. Positive and negative are impacting it equally. It actually looks like negative is it's left things a little more negative, so we're kind of drifting negative. And it's a key thing to remember about the integral too. If we don't have any sort of reset type tied to it, it's going to drift depending on if we have a negative offset or a positive offset, or if the single spends more time being negative than it does being positive, or has more negative peaks, I should say. So standard integral, obviously, for this data, really doesn't tell us much. There's also a positive only that will only look at the positive values. Since we're only looking at positive values, it's going to be additive for every positive value, and it's going to drift up. You can probably guess negative would be the same way, same thing, but it could be you know, these these different types can be useful for other signals. So definitely don't write them off and always go to what I'm going to show you here. There's also an absolute value one. So of course we have our source channel, the integral type, reset, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You can actually do definite integrals in a channel. I only want to do it from such and such a second to another. Uh, we can change our scale options here, just like before. Decimal places, auto scale, and of course we have our links directly to the, the help menu topic for this. So absolute value works really well for EEG data like this. We're taking everything that's negative, and making it positive. So it kind of gives us an idea of activity. Uh, of course, we're going to have an even worse positive drift with this. And this is where reset types come into play with integrals. There are a variety of one. Default would be no reset. Timed reset would be, I want you to go back to zero every, every so many seconds. Works okay. We're seeing, okay, yeah, we've, we've got some definite 
activity. Uh, it, looks like, it looks like there's more here because we have a couple higher spikes, but really not as good as we could do here with integral. So if I go to integral again, there's a reset each cycle, which we'll talk about a little bit, will not work very well for this at all. There's also a reset by event, where I could say, okay, I'm looking here, I have a threshold, I want you to reset to zero every time that happens, whenever you cross that threshold rising. And then after it happens, I want you to skip so many seconds. Eh, works a little bit better. We're actually getting a spike more that relates to the specific burst, but still not great. We can do it, definitely do better than this. And the one I would use would be time constant decay. Time constant decay, what it does, we determine the integral, and then it uses a decay equation. Uh, with, and, and then what we're adjusting here with the seconds right here is the actual tau, the decay, decay constant for that decay, decay equation. And this kind of smooths things out, and it pr puts this decay equation on there to kind of let things reset slowly back, but it still is keeping track of what's going on with, with the integral a little bit better. So if I hit OK with that, you'll notice I have these nice spikes right here. And then as we're doing the integral, there's a decay equation that's kind of moving along in front of it that's decaying it back down to zero. Now if I use smaller decay constants, it has less of an impact and we start getting more spiky data, kind of like what we had, happened, we had happening when we were doing that reset every event with the threshold or we can start making them larger. Usually for EEG data, 0.2 to 0.6 works pretty well. We kind of smooth things out and focus on those areas, those regions that are really important to us. This gives us something quantifiable here, an amplitude. Now notice when we're looking at events, we thought, oh, these are not, they're kind of different. This one might have more activity. Not necessarily. We can look at it here. Now, of course, with the data pad, we can come through here, find max, and give us hard numbers that relate to activity. And once again, that's integral, absolute value, time constant decay. And my very last example here is going, we're going back to that spirometry file. Volume is the integral of flow, and we have flow here. It's the only negative flow, but it is going back. Now, since it's only going, it's negative, and it's it's definitely a cycle every time it happens, we say reset each cycle. So lab chart looks at the original data, which is our flow data. We're only looking at the negative portions, and we're resetting at the end of each cycle. When the when the uh, data goes up and it comes back down and crosses that threshold, everything else is the same. We hit OK, and it gives us the integral for that cycle, the area under the curve right here, and at the very end resets back to zero and gets us ready for the next one. Area under the curve right here at the max, then resets back. So definitely ways that we can go ahead and look at data and figure out different things. So like I said, volume is the integral of flow. Uh, our spirometry module actually uses this very similar algorithm to do this. Uh, it's got a little bit of tweaking here and there to make it better. But uh, if you didn't want to use a spirometry module, if you had something else you're bringing in, you could go ahead and use integral to figure out the volume as well. So that takes us to the end of everything I'm going to cover today. Uh, before I get to any questions, I want to bring my presentation up one more time and give you my contact information. So obviously, you're more than welcome to answer questions here. But if you think of something later on, maybe you're reviewing the recording of this uh, that you will receive in a couple of days, 
you know, I have, I have a question that come up, came up. Definitely give me a call or give my counterpart, Emily Peace, a call. Uh, you could reach both of us through this uh, 888 number. However, she's at a different extension. And just ask for Emily Peace. Uh, maybe if you're on the East Coast and it's around 8 o'clock your morning, I won't be in the office yet, but Emily should be in hers. Uh, but once again, anything about what we've covered today, feel free to give me a call. Anything that we didn't cover today, please, please give me a call. If you have questions about hardware, you have questions about software, please contact me. So I've got my telephone number up here, uh, my Skype handle, I'm on Skype pretty regular uh, throughout the day, and also my email address. So please definitely contact me. So now that I have that up there, we're going to go ahead and look at some questions here. Um, I have a question here, is SmartView available in Mac? And I'm not sure what you mean by SmartView. Do you mean Smart Tile, uh, where I actually went through, I'm going to go ahead and open up the lab chart here again, I'm going to exit out of my presentation. And were you referring to this? where I tiled it. Yes, okay. Um, if memory serves, you do have layout options like this. They won't be exactly the same, but I believe Smart Tile is available. Uh, if you don't have a toolbar, toolbar icon for it, uh, right out here, 